So today on our podcast, we are joined by Simon Richardson, a two-time gold medalist from Beijing Olympics, and along the way, breaking a world record during them as well. He was also asked to become a member of the Order of the British Empire and was a torch carrier during the London 2012 Paralympic ceremony as well. Simon, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. No, it's a pleasure to have you. So if you don't mind, I would like to start sort of at the beginning of your Paralympic journey, because unlike many people who compete at these games, you, you were not born disabled. It was something that was sort of uh, come upon you really through, a, through an accident. And I was wondering if you could talk us through what happened and um, how it ended up being that you were competing in the Paralympics. Yeah, OK. Um, with a lot of disabled actually in the event, a lot of them are actually accidents within my category because we are locomotion injuries. So a lot of them are ex-pro cyclists and stuff like that to crash your major races and things like that. But in my case, I'd started riding in about 1999 uh, just to get some fitness. And in 2001, I got clipped by a car, uh, put me into the side of the road, broke my right leg. And we thought that was all that was the problem was. So I, went, I was in hospital for four days. And about six months afterwards, I was back racing everything, but I was having back problems. And I went privately because I had some medical cover with the company I was with. And they said I'd had a broken accident in the back as well. Sorry, a broken back in the accident as well. And uh, it should have been treated at the time. I was in hospital in the first place by the NHS. So wow. I had to have an operation in November 2001 to stabilise everything. Then I had another operation in 2003 with the back as well. But it left me with a, a jammed sciatica nerve which yeah. left me with nerve damage to my left-hand side. And I was told, basically, if I don't do exercise, I'll probably lose a leg because I'll probably wither a bit and it'll, it'll get worse. So I started back on the bike in the garage, I think, about towards the end of 2005 into 2006. And basically, that's, that's where I started in my disabled uh, riding from then on. OK, so obviously that... You could have held a lot of anger and um, frustration towards the NHS and the people that served you, but you actually went down a different route, didn't you? You took, a, I guess, a bit more of a positive stance in it, using what happened to you and that motivation to get exercise, and like you say, starting in your garage, but obviously it didn't stay there, did that? So how did you overcome that sort of, what must have been pure, well, I don't want to call it anger, because obviously I don't know exactly what you felt, but... How did you overcome that to turn into something positive? Um, I don't, it's difficult. I don't think I was, I was never really angry with the driver that hit me because it was an accident. She got blinded by the sun. She knew I was there, but she came in too early on me and caught me. NHS, I was frustrated with because they wouldn't take what I was saying as serious. It's like when I went in there, to complain about the back. They offered me an injection in the coccyx area without x-rays or anything. So that's why I discharged myself and went private because I, I was just wasn't getting anywhere with them. But what I was lucky with was the consultant I saw privately, he was a very high up in sports. He played tennis uh, for Wales sort of thing. He did rugby uh, at a high level as well. So he was very sports orientated. So he knew what he was talking about. and. I think with him and with the physio I had, who was also a sports physio, they sort of got me in a me mental state to be in the garage training. But I was then lucky that one of my friends from the cycle club I was in, they had an open event down at Newport Velodrome. And he basically dragged me down there. I wasn't going to ride, but they basically made me get on a bike and ride it. And from then on, I could basically hook back into it. Mm. And it all started from there, sort of thing. So you wasn't aiming to sort of to be an Olympian before this all happened. Then it was due to what happened. It led on to that. Then, yeah, I was. I got picked. I got noticed by the Welsh organisation about the disability, but they weren't sure where to place me within the disability groups. 
But what I was lucky was then that I spoke to the coach for British Cycling and he decided that because I had lack of power on the left-hand side, I could use a reduced size crank arm with a pedal on. So it take, took away any power that I could be cheating with on my left-hand side, which then put me in a category racing with people with only one leg, um, which made it all equal sort of thing. I, I was also then lucky that I got picked up by a coach who was also a friend at the time, who is, uh, his name is Courtney Rowe, and he has a son, Luke Rowe, who's actually a rise for Ineos, the Tour de France and everything. And he's got about 10 people into uh, British Olympic teams. So he'd never done a disabled athlete and he wanted to train me as well. So it all started off as a bit of a joke. We said, right, what do you want first? Okay, uh, I'll ride for the British team. Right, so that happened. The next choice was World Championships. Yeah, okay. Then we had, right, okay, we've got nothing left. We do Paralympics. Not thinking anything was going to happen, but in 2008 with his training in about uh, March time, I broke the world record for the kilometre on the track, which then gave me what they call a sort of a bipartite place into the Paralympics, because every country, you've got to earn points, and the points are sorted out into places, how many people you can have right for the team. Like, we only had about six or seven, but because I'd broken the world record, the Paralympic Committee wanted me there. So they gave the British team an extra place to take me sort of thing. So it was all done basically as not serious to start with. Even though I was seriously training, it wasn't expected to go to the Paralympics. Oh, that's brilliant. That's such a, a nice spin on something because sometimes you hear people giving it their all bits. That's such a sort of like a nice, jolly sort of story to hear. So can you talk us through like what it was like being at the Beijing Olympics? Because like being at any Olympics must just be, I mean, it's something that so few people get to experience. Like, what was it like turning up, being with your teammates, the opening ceremony, and just all that sort of stuff? Yeah, it starts off as a strange experience. So I was basically away for three months before the Games as well, training. I was only coming back for like a weekend, then flying back out to somewhere else, then back for another weekend, and back out to somewhere else sort of thing before we went to Beijing. But I don't know if I treated it as anything different to anybody else, but the people I was racing in Beijing, I raced with every weekend, whether it was on the track or on the road. So we all knew each other, we were all friends. So we all just treated as just a normal event for the, for the competition. But the only strange thing is actually being in a village with all those people, with a 24 hour food hall, there's, you know, it's permanently cooking all the time. You never know what time people are going to be racing so they, what time they're going to eat. Because if you consider swimmers, they go in the pool early or they go in the pool late. So they eat at different times to what the cyclists are. So you then go be careful what you eat because you don't know how long food has been sitting there. <laughs> so it's, it's very difficult to work out what to do within the village. And I know it doesn't sound right, but what we had there, like it's sponsored by McDonald's, Coca-Cola as well. So you had a McDonald's place actually in the food hall and most of us at mcdonald's every day because <laughs> you could see cooked in front of you yeah you know, and you could guarantee it was fresh but the rest of the food you didn't know because like the, a lot of the swimmers they stopped in hong kong on the way across before they came to uh, the village and most of, a lot of them had food poisoning so oh, right. they were struggling in the games so I said, it sounds strange that like you're eating McDonald's for the games, but it was fresh. You knew exactly what was in it, and you knew it wasn't going to upset your stomach. You're obviously eating your, your breakfast and your energy foods and stuff like that, but you're topping yourself up just with that. Um, it's also another strange thing that happened within the village. When the Olympic team were there, they had Wi-Fi in all of the village, in every room sort of thing. We, we went there, they took it all out because we didn't need it, they said. So we only had Wi-Fi in one little area that nobody else, not everybody could fit into. So you had people sitting outside trying to connect to Wi-Fi and everything. And it's re really strange how, at that time, they thought the disabled were 
not as worthy as the able-bodied. I know it's changed a bit now. It's still not right, but yeah, it's strange like that in the village and living on top of people. Then the opening ceremony, I didn't go to because I was racing the day after. So I, I, I couldn't go because I was, had to be up at about six to go to the velodrome to get ready for the racing. Right. So I, I missed all that, which, which again, I, I don't mind because I went to the closing ceremony and you don't see anything. You see more on the screens because you're so low down. Yeah. Like, everything is built for high level cameras. So it's not much of a waste not going there. It, of course, it would have been nice, but the racing came first. Fair enough. That's so weird to hear that McDonald's was the um, healthiest option at the time. <laughs> that wasn't that wasn't what I was expecting for you to say it was um, what you would be eating in the Olympic Village for sure. That that's definitely an insight I wasn't expecting. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when you did do your race, then you obviously had thousands of people watching you in stadium and most probably millions on TV as well. And you were saying yeah. that you didn't really you it all started off as a bit of a joke and it wasn't that serious. And then the pressure must have just hit you like a ton of bricks, though, at, at that point, thinking, well, it's global now. Yeah, it's, I don't know, it's, again, it's strange. I, I deal with pressure in a strange way, I think, because I got my routine set exactly what I got to do when I get to the track and everything. And as I said, all those people I race with every weekend. So it's just like a normal track meet. You know, the same coaches, the same managers, the same athletes. We knew who should win it, we knew who's going to come, you know, sort of positions that should happen and everything. But you just turn up, you get changed, you get on your bike, you warm up a little bit. Then with me, once I go into full warm up mode, I wear my sunglasses. So once I put my sunglasses down, nobody talks to me. So even the coaches will walk away because they know then you're in full warm up mode, ready to get on the races. But then it's, I don't know, it's just, um, Strange situation because, like, again, you got I think 4,000 spectators or something like that in the velodrome. Can't remember offhand. But when you're in the center, you can't really hear them, especially with the helmets on, because uh, you don't realize how much they're shouting until uh, you've actually finished. Especially with the type of helmets we had, they had very good uh, sound blocking then to try and take that away from you, which, which again was good. But well, I think the best thing about the velodrome was we had a lot of uh, Chinese children in there which weren't able to go to the able-bodied because they couldn't afford the tickets. Mm-hmm. So whereas the able-bodied was, one ticket was, say, a month's wages, but for us, they were basically a day's wages sort of thing. So they got all the children in there and they gave all the children flags of different nations. So okay. they all cheered for different uh, parts of the nation. So they not just for China, which was, it was quite good actually that way because it gave everybody that extra uh, bit of a, a lift. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Wow. Brilliant. So then after the success, success of Beijing, you come home, two gold medals, a silver medal, and then you find out you're going to be asked to become a member of the Order of the British Empire. Like, how do you find that out? Is it a phone call? Is it a letter? Is it a guard turning up at your door. I'm not quite sure how that process works. Right. Um, it's actually a, a member because I've only the MVE. I didn't get the OBE. I, I was one medal short for OBE. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. What happened was we had a letter in November to say about it. Then you had to write back or email them back to confirm you wanted it. But then you had to keep it secret until it was released in the New Year's Honours list. So we, so myself and my wife knew in November, but we weren't able to tell anybody. Oh. So it's, it's, it's difficult, really, because people say they find out they're close to the time, but you actually know months in ahead. And to try and keep it a secret, because the press obviously know it's been released, so they're always plugging you for, did you get anything? We heard the British team are getting this, this, and this sort of thing. Uh, it's, yeah, so you, you know plenty of time. But it's strange when they ask you, do you want this award or not? Because there are people who actually do turn it down. Oh, right. There's a couple of, fam- there's a couple of famous people who turn it down. I can't remember names off the top of my head. But, uh, yeah, some people don't want it. Is it like an RSVP at the bottom, then? Would you like to accept? <laughs> yeah, basic- basically, yeah. <laughs> oh, OK. Um, so then, obviously, yeah. you went to Buckingham Palace, I guess, to get presented with it. 
How was that? Yes. Who who were, who was the one who gave you it? Uh, I had Prince Charles, which is good. Um, I was one of the last to go up for it because of it's all done in alphabetical order, obviously. But the one thing at that time I was on double sticks. Same with my friend Darren Kenny, he was also on double sticks, and neither of us have walked backwards on sticks because not something you do. So we had to practice there actually walking back on sticks because you're not allowed to turn on the whoever's giving you the medal, uh, the MVE, sorry. But the other thing, good thing with Prince Charles as well, he didn't stop talking to me. And what they say is you put your hand up, you shake hands, and once he leaves go, that's it. That's the end of the talk. But he would only go my hand. He was asking me about the mountains in Wales and what I like about riding them and all this lot. And we actually had the person in charge tapping his watch by the side of him. <laughs> to to hurry up to do it at a time. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's, a nice, it's a nice experience. It must have been. It's, it's better than I thought it was going to be. But the MBE was I'm going to put it, more of a surprise than the medals were. The medals I was employed, I was employed to go and get medals. Right, that that was my job. It's the same as a teacher; they get an award, you know, it's for doing their job. The medals for doing my job, well done, sort of thing. So, so getting the MBE, that was a bit more of a shock than anything else. Mm, yeah, oh, I didn't think of it like that. Yeah, nice. And I guess there was the full spread and everything. Like, did you go? Uh, do you go into the palace afterwards, and do you get to meet more royal family, or is it just a ceremony and then you sort of leave? It's uh, just a ceremony. You, we basically stayed. In a hotel around the corner. Um, we then take it by taxi. You can drive in by taxi, but it's such a long queue, it's pointless. So you have a queue outside, you jump out the taxi out the front, and you go walk through the gates, take it inside, uh, take it upstairs to a room where the person who runs the event itself is there, and he, he tells you what to do. He talks to everybody. Uh, that's where you meet all the uh, Top brass and basically uh, no behind the Prince Charles, but all the other military brass and all that lot. Uh, then you have your medal pres presentation. You then basically leave. But in my case, I left from there straight into interviews, and then you have your photograph taken outside, and that's basically it. You then go home. Oh. So it's, it's, not much, it's not much to it afterwards. It's, it's just it's a good experience. It's just not not a lot happening sort of thing but you get used to that anyway <laughs> fair enough um so beijing's gone you got your mbe and you were one of the favorites to go towards london 2012 as well weren't you but then um, again you were in a it was another accident wasn't it yeah i i still had to qualify because you always have to qualify every every time for the games qualify was i believe about march 2012 so not long before the games actually started to the qualification. But yeah, at that time of the accident, I think 2010, I was doing uh, 20,000 miles a year on the road without racing. So that's, that's, that's my yearly mileage so, as well. So I was, at the time, extremely fit. I was probably, I could guarantee a top five in any road race or time trial in the world. And I could always guarantee as at least a top two in the kilometre on the track at mm. that time. Um, but yeah, I was out training August um, 2011. Went up a small climb, only not rushing because I was going to meet somebody. And a van hit me at 60 miles an hour from behind, uh, left me for dead at the side of the road. A car ahead, of, a car ahead of me stopped, stopped him. He then drove around that car and disappeared further up the road. We're lucky that the person who stopped it, who was a sergeant major in our local uh, Air Force base, he got a description and a part of registration. So once he gave him that, the police knew who he was anyway, because he's a farmer just a bit further up the road. And they couldn't find his van. The helicopter found it about an hour later, buried in the bushes on the farm, with a big hole in the windscreen, parts of my uh, clothing in it sort of thing. And he was sitting in the house drinking whiskey because he started drinking about six o'clock that morning. Legally, they, well, they tested him because they had to do um, a blood count back sort of thing because he was so far gone. He was 
they they believe at the time over six times over the limit, but he was charged with about three times because that was the easiest one to get through, which is the same difference anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, he then got sent to jail, 18 months in jail, which is the maximum sentence at the time. Uh, seen at the accident was treated as a uh, possible death because I, I was borderline for 15 days because I, I was in a coma for 15 days and basically only just pulled through because he left me. I put the bike frames through my left leg, broke my pelvis front and back, broke my sternum, uh, pierced the bowel, um, broke my back in seven places, punctured lung, uh, blood, sorry, not punctured, collapsed lung, blood clots on the other lung and a brain injury. And my body just shut down basically. So as of 15 days, my wife was told to expect a phone call every night because they just didn't know what I was going to pull through it. Uh, I'm lucky that with the, the breaks in the back, none of it severed the spinal cord. So even though I've got metal work now from T4 to S1, so I can't bend at all, and without the metal work, my spine would just collapse, I am still able to stand, even though I use a wheelchair nearly all the time now. The left side is so weak, hmm. it just gives out to me. Well, I, th- I think a good yeah. word to use for you is like resilient because you that that wasn't really the end, even though that put you like say in a coma of 15 days and counseled you out of the London 2012 Olympics. You, you still you still carried the flame, didn't you? You still got up and you were still part of that that journey. Did, did that make up for it a little bit? It, it did a little bit. Um. I was lucky because I actually lit the cauldron in Cardiff to start the, ga- start the games. And I also carried the, f- the torch on Canary Wharf. So there's not many people who actually get to hold two torches. So I was actually able to buy the two torches off them because the, they give you they allow, allow you to buy them afterwards at a special price sort of thing. So that was an honour. I was also lucky that uh, I got uh, free tickets to probably the best day in the velodrome as well. Which was which was nice because I saw my friends racing. Yeah. So, oh, very so nice. That's, amazing. that's such a positive spin on it. So I'm going to ask a bit of a, an odd question now, and I hope you don't mind it. But with those incredible highs you've had, obviously the unbelievable lows, would you class yourself as a lucky person? Um, yeah, I suppose I am lucky. I, I've got away with it, put it that way. You know, oh. it, it could so easily have gone the other way. So, yeah, there must be a bit of luck there. And some, I think the second accident is a lot of good NHS workers in that uh, UCI department. And uh, without them, you know, I, I, w- I wouldn't be where I am now. No. You know? uh, but, yeah, it's probably a bit of luck and uh, stubbornness. <laughs> I still think that's positive because I think so many people could suffer not one but two sort of life-changing accidents like that and class himself as an unlucky person but to be able to sit there and say you still think you're a lucky person and stubborn I, I'd say like I said, I'd say resilient not stubborn <laughs> yeah. um what's there, there is one that, um, oh, God. Before that um if I hadn't had the first accident I wouldn't have gone to Beijing I wouldn't have raced nearly all over the world I wouldn't have got the gold medals. I wouldn't have got the MBE. So that's all the positive side of having the accident. I know at the time it doesn't look like that, but there are positives out there as well with whatever happens. Yeah, and I think that's such a, a great message to send home to everyone, and especially any students watching this, that there, there is positives to come. Like, like you said, the lows of the low, there's still those positives that outcome. And it's fantastic to talk to people like you who can show that there are positives after something that people could class as just unbelievably tragic. Um, yeah, so, so what's next for Simon then? What's, what are you looking forward to next? Um, well, August last year, I was given the all clear by the consultant to train and race again. So this year now, I, I've done two races. I was supposed to race more during the summer, but we had a family problem, so it all stopped for a bit. So I've been training all this year, and next year I am... Um, Going to be racing again, doing a, some long charity rides, stuff like that. I just uh, signed up with a able-bodied uh, cycle team as well, so that, that's good. Uh, so back into cycling, but I haven't been on the road yet as such. So I got my first experience on the road, I think, about November this year. So I'm a bit nervous about that. Yeah, I'm sure. 
fingers crossed i'm sure it'll be fine um so is that a, did you say a charity one what charity is it you're doing it for i'm doing it for one of the rides is manchester to paris it's for men cap because one of my sponsors his daughter died in july this year so they were looking after her so we're doing it for that and the other one i can't remember off the top of my head but it's uh to do with um, supporting up and coming young young people within sports, music, and stuff like that, where they haven't got the finance, because the charity organizer, his son, and their band, their bus crashed in uh, Sweden or something, and they all died. So he opened up a charity to try and help yeah. younger people, about 15, 16, when they start to struggle, trying to find the help they need to progress further on. With their decision in life for what they want to do well if you let us know at a later date what that charity is and we'll make sure we put the links to both charities yeah. in the comments um so then with all that success you've had in cycling and the paralympics and all you do for disabled sport now and the fact like i've already said you're clearly a very resilient and strong-willed man do you think any of that came out of your school education now i do ask this to everyone we speak to and I know we're a school, but we do understand not everything is learned within the school. So we do try and ask for a nice, honest answer. So, yeah, do you put any of this down to your school education about the successful man you've become? I think it's school actually taught me to care about myself and care about the people that are close to me because school wasn't my best time in life. I hated every day of it. I was glad to leave. I was uh, bullied every day through the comp. And at that time, you had no uh, backup like you have now. Then you just basically had to get on with it yourself. So as I said, I was just glad to get out of it. But I think because of that, I've used to looking after myself, looking after my family and doing things just for ourselves rather than caring what everybody else wants. I think that way, it's maybe, I said, as you said before, more resilient to everything. Uh, more stubborn because I want it done. I'll do it my way, sort of thing. No, that that's really that's really sad to hear. And I usually follow this up by saying, "What do you wish you were taught in school?" But I'm going to slightly change the question for you. Is that what do you wish was put in place for you in school? Then, what do you think would have helped with that bullying and maybe being able to stop it and not going through the whole school like that? I th I think what people have got now, they they've got their peers they can talk to, whether it's uh, sixth form children or you have a specific teacher you could talk to, which I said in my time in the eighties you just didn't have that. It was just uh, get on with life. That that was part of it. The biggest problem I had was I was tall. I also got had gin very ginger hair, and at that time you didn't have ginger hair in schools, yeah. so I was the only odd I was the odd one out. Now. Is obviously mixed ginger, dark hairs, all different races. And even though the bullying is still there, I think you've got more of a structure to help people than what we had. And that's what we, we missed out on. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think it's awful when you hear people who have been through uh, bullying and stuff like that in school. It's, I, could, I can't imagine anything worse, especially because I had such a positive experience at school. But if you could sort of reach out to people who are experiencing bullying now in schools, what sort of advice or techniques would you sort of give to him or try and help him through the process? I think the only thing you can do is try not to do it by yourself. Just try and find somebody you could talk to, your favourite teacher, um, maybe somebody who's slightly older than you that can help you out, point you in the right direction. Um, it doesn't even have to be somebody in school. It could be somebody out of the school premises that can help you a bit. And again, point you in that right direction. Even if you go and make a phone call or phone up one of the charities so they can give you the advice you actually need to uh, help you out and tell you where you should, which, what you should be doing next. Mm. Yeah, that's a really good point, actually. We'll put a number below as well after you saying that for anyone who is um, suffering with bullying. That's, yeah, that's, that's a really, really sad story to sort of hear. Um, so I'm, I'm going to end this with two final questions, if you don't mind. Now, and I asked this to everyone who joins us, and this one may be slightly difficult for you, obviously, after what you just said, but do you have a sort of a fondest memory from school at all? Is there anything you can look back on and say, that still makes me smile, even though everything else that I went through? No, nothing at all. All I 
all I used to enjoy was the bell at the end of the day to get home. Oh. That was it. Do it was it was torture most of the time. Oh, yeah. that- I had friends in school, but we didn't mix in the school because if I mixed my friends in school, they get bullied as well. So I'd only ever see them out of school time for for their sakes more than anything else. So they didn't get picked on. Yeah. But yeah, I was just happy to hear the bell at the end of the day. Oh, that is that is that's really that's really sad to hear. Um, okay, so then the second question then. If you could pass on just one bit of advice to students who are currently in school now, you've already given a bit of advice towards bullying, but in hindsight, if we can look back and sort of folks are saying that's not to do with bullying, what's that one bit of advice you would give to anyone in school right now? Um, find what you're good at, stick to it and do it. Don't be pressurised into doing something that you believe you should be doing. Make your own choices and you'll be surprised how far you could actually go with it when you make your own decisions and you're not forcing to do something that even your parents believe you should be doing. Find your own line and stick to it. That's really, really nice. Um, so if anyone is interested in following your journey, especially with all the stuff that's coming up or learning more about you, are you on any social media platforms where they can follow your journey? Yeah, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter. I've got a new... A website coming up that hasn't quite been finished yet so there's old websites out there flying around about me but there will be a new one published soon and that'll be on my facebook group anyway and my instagram account so anybody can follow those they're, they're open to anyone so if any of the children want to jump on there they can do i don't befriend children but if they come to me i will follow i will allow them to follow me right okay very nice and we'll link all your um social media down below as well um, yeah. so once again, Simon, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And after that com- uh, conversation, I mean, I know I said you're resilient, but I would also add on there inspirational. I mean, to go through school, like say, hating school and the two different accidents you've had and to, to see you sat here and still chat with me, smiling, laughing and just sending out such positive vibes. It, it has been very inspirational for me to speak to you. And um yeah, we wish you all the best for the future. And just once again, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thank you very much for having me on, on here. You're very really good. Thank you for watching our podcast today. If you enjoyed it, don't forget to hit that subscribe button to make sure you never miss out on the new ones we post every Monday and Wednesday. If you are interested in enrolling yourself or someone else into the British Online School, be sure to visit our website britishonlineschool.co.uk or you can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and send us a direct message there as well. Just use the handle at Brit Online School, spelled S-C-H and you can find all our links below. Have a fantastic day and we look forward to seeing you again soon.